Hello, and welcome to this lecture on Muay Thai and Trans-Pacific Labor Trafficking. My name is Aidan Kwach, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Southern California, researching historical and contemporary notions of sex, gender, race, and sexuality in social spaces across the Trans-Pacific. This lecture contains content regarding the physical and sexual exploitation of children. While no images will be shown displaying violence, this content flag is here to help ensure that you have the tools to make an informed decision about what you learn and how you learn it. This is also an important reminder to note that this lecture contains the stories and lives of real women and children, and that history bleeds with injustice. The practice of learning this material is thus an important practice in considering the power of knowledge, of learning, and of unlearning. This lecture has mainly two objectives. Firstly, to identify the key issues around historical Muay Thai child labor slash sex trafficking. Secondly, to discuss gender and age as components of labor and control over people. To guide your understanding of this lecture, I will provide you with note-taking questions to help ground your inquiry and provide you with a foundation for studying. In line with the learning objectives, the questions are, who slash what is a Muay Thai? How can we use age as a category of analysis? Before we deep dive into the lecture, this is probably a good juncture to discuss where the material of this lecture is coming from. Most of the material translated and used for analysis comes from the Chinese Times, which was the longest running Chinese newspaper in Chinese Canadian history. The work of archiving this newspaper was done through Simon Fraser University. The newspaper documented the everyday of Chinese Canadians in the Vancouver area, including the process of immigration, local and global politics, the effect of Chinese exclusion, racism, as well as Chinese involvement in World War I and World War II. It is important to note here that the newspaper was published by the Chinese Freemason Society of Canada and catered mostly to Chinese male readers. What might the readership consisting of male readers suggest? This is something to consider as we explore how women are written by men in the snippets we do have from the archive. On the SFU archive page, you will be able to access nearly all the pages of the newspaper published from 1914 to 1992. There is also the ability to zoom in and take a look in detail at every ad, every entry, and every photograph should you wish. So let me now begin this lecture in earnest through a question. Who or what is a Muay Thai? Let's first start with the term. Muay Thai comes from the Chinese term meaning little sister. The popularized pronunciation of these characters follows Cantonese rather than the Mandarin Meizi. Another term that was occasionally used in sources was Jufa or pig flowers. Muay Thai broadly referred to young girls from southern China from Cantonese, Hakka, and Hokkien backgrounds ages 16 to 18 years old. In families where there were too many mouths to feed, it was often considered a fate better than just starving at home. It built into Buddhist ideas of saving lives through giving them work and purpose. In many cases, these children were sold to wealthy Chinese elite abroad who wanted labor, physical and sexual labor inclusive. There were also instances of these children being sold to white masters. Muay Thai were sold in East and Southeast Asia and Oceania. Big locales for this trade included Singapore, Hong Kong, and Australia. In these spaces, the children were sold as personal servants, as nannies, as entertainers in theater troops, or coffee shop workers. In North America, these girls were sold into sexual slavery as part of menial labor, or to be brides to single men. I make here a specific note that in Hong Kong, Muay Thai made up the second largest group of laborers in the late 19th century, with numbers ranging from 7,000 to 10,000. In one account available to us, we run into the complexity of the Muay Thai system from the viewpoint of the children being sold. Muay Thai maintained an uncomfortable double status and position of being both part of the family unit, yet also not part of the family. In Janet Lim's 
autobiography of her life as a muizai. She discusses her confusion and betrayal of being adopted to be a daughter to a wealthy Chinese man, but then being used as disposable labor. In the specific passage here, she discusses what it feels like to be standing at an auction while people name their price and by extension, her value as a tool for labor. I was looked at, criticized, and after much bargaining, sold for $250. It is very difficult for people to understand what it means to be a slave, to be bargained for and sold like merchandise, to suffer shame and the whips of one's master and mistress. I soon learned that a servant had a higher status than a slave. Because the slave had been purchased, the master could do whatever he pleased with her. My outlook changed. I no longer looked forward to the days ahead, but moved about like a machine. I envied the happy little girls, secure in their mother's love, who often visited the family. In this excerpt of Janet Lim's autobiography, she discusses her fear of sexual exploitation and how these children live their lives in terror, the terror of which, in many cases, haunted them well into adulthood. My master was a rich man, a landowner, and he had many friends. He often had parties and got drunk, but fortunately, when drunk, he slept and was not violent. More often, he suffered from insomnia, and then he would walk around the whole house visiting all the women's rooms. I had been told by the members of the household that he craved for female company. After about three months, he started trying to visit me at night. I cannot express my terror when I heard his footsteps. I crawled anywhere, inside cupboards, under the beds, outside the windows, anywhere, as long as I could get out of his reach. Let's turn to a few examples within the Chinese times. In North America, Muizai worked labor jobs, including waitresses, as performers, cleaners, and masseuses. In the ad found in the Chinese times to the right and highlighted in green, you will find that this specific bar advertises their workers in a particularly inviting manner noting that the waitresses are beautiful with makeup on and that requests will be honored, the nature of which is purposefully left vague. Here, in another example, we see the specific role of muizai being advertised on a job board as something people are looking for, albeit not for the reason that you might be thinking of, which we'll discuss in the following slides. Here, highlighted in green, is an announcement from the Zhigong Hall, which is in the city port. There is a subheading for those taking advantage of the market, which is highlighted in yellow. It is under this listing that we see muizai circled in red as a category to watch out for. There are also cases of women being put in advertisements as a method of blacklisting them and making sure that they are not hired. The following three ads are sources that provide us with the new different perspective about muizai and how men try to control women through public shaming. In this example, a man is putting in an advertisement out to ensure that his runaway sister is not hired for waitress jobs and goes as far as to include a photo of her in order to make sure that she cannot be hired. In this example, a man puts in a notice to ensure that his younger brother's wife does not run away and find a job without the permission of her husband. The goal appears to be to ensure that she is not able to sign a contract and to ensure that she is not being mischievous or that she is being unfaithful to her family. This particular example here discusses how a woman was charged for being unruly as well as not following regulations expected of her as a woman. Take note here of how she is described as a beast and how she has been blacklisted from gaining employment. We can summarily think about these three ads that I have shown as a mixture of many responses to the idea of muizai, waitresses, and unruly women in the early history of Chinese migration to British Columbia. Firstly, we might consider that these ads protect employers from accidentally hiring mischievous, unruly women. We might also consider these ads as a way of protecting their own family members from being hired 
and larger issues of shame that overseas Chinese women can bring dishonor not just to their new local communities, but to their families back home. Thus far, we have looked at how women have been depicted in writing as unruly and people to be managed by men. In many ways, we cannot also escape the importance that many of these women came to Canada as children, as muizai. So extending beyond gender, how might age be used as a category of analysis? Moreover, what happens when the muizai grows up? It might be useful to reflect on how age and generation play into our own daily lives and upbringing. What kind of ages are important to you? Of course, the big one that we might be familiar with is the importance of the age of 19 in Canada, as this is the age that you are allowed to purchase and consume alcohol legally. This, of course, is 21 in the US. We might also think about how 60 is an important number in Chinese culture because it symbolizes a complete cycle through not just all the 12 animals of the zodiac, but also all five elements of the zodiac. You might also think about the coming of age ceremony in Japan as being important to youth. Of course, in most of these cases, except for the example of the 60th birthday, these numbers are at times arbitrary. Using the age of 19 or 21 to demarcate adulthood does not mean much in the grand scheme of things, but yet this is how our legal system designates power to people. We might think about this issue of age and generation, therefore, as part of a larger project to control populations and people. Historian Rachel Lowe argues this precisely in her article, Age as a Category of Gender Analysis, Servant Girls, Modern Girls, and Gender in Southeast Asia. In said article, she uses Muizai as a case study to look at the development of the category of child and adult. In looking at news excerpts, such as the ones that have been presented in this lecture, Lowe argues how girls are treated as human merchandise that fundamentally are problematic as they will age out of girlhood and become women. She goes on to discuss that the movement to abolish slave labor also coincided with discussion with the universal rights of children and the idea that children should be free to choose, to grow, and to develop as individuals. We will later see this culminate in the anti muizai movement in Hong Kong and spread across British colonies. To summarize, age was a way to control culture and people in colonial societies, and the age of 18 becomes an important one where a child can become a man or a woman. So here we should ask, what happens when the muizai grows up? As all children age, they develop a sense of self and agency. This is no different in the case of muizai. They became considered threats to power as they became women. You might recall how the women that were depicted in the Chinese times were considered unruly because they sought employment. In many cases, employment meant money, and money meant agency and less of a need on men for support. This was different for Muizai as they were indentured laborers. Their growing agency meant that they ran the risk of seducing the master of the house and supplanting the wife, or potentially becoming the head of the other servants, such as becoming an ama, where they were responsible for taking care of the children of the master and thus holding considerable influence on their upbringing and the servants that were needed to take care of the children's needs. In some cases, Muizai who reached puberty were set up in marriages to local Chinese or sold off for sex work. Given the social immorality associated with sex work at the time, sex workers were considered to be disease carriers. In the previous slide, I discussed women agency as threat of power to men. In this particular slide, I move to offer a different vantage point to looking at the agency of women through the perspective of women themselves. In this video clip from San Francisco in the early 20th century, 
we see two women, believed to be muizai, entertaining older men at a restaurant. They form a close relationship with each other and support each other as they entertain their guests. Notice that the second one of the men makes an advance to take advantage of the girls, they slap the man and proceed to leave. This form of allyship might hint at a larger sisterhood and bond developing between women as they got older and became aware of the precarity of their situation. By the late 19th century, there was an active movement to abolish the Muizai system. This was instigated in Hong Kong by Hugh Hazelwood and his wife Clara Hazelwood, who believed this practice to be profoundly barbaric and uncivilized. A society in Hong Kong also formed to protect women and children from being abducted into the Muizai system. By teaching them domestic skills, they sought to save these girls from indentured labor. It was also a method to clean former Muizai girls and sex workers so that they might have a second chance at life. Slowly, this system started to spread throughout other British colonies. Here, we can see that the discourse around Muizai was starting to spread and proliferate other colonial locales, such as Singapore. The argument that Muizai were a problem in Singapore actually was closely correlated in the eyes of the colonial elite to be part of a health issue in Singapore. Some of the colonial elite theorized the child trafficking was leading to more sex workers in Singapore, and thus responsible for an expanding health crisis of sexually transmitted diseases. We might demarcate the start of the end of the Muizai system to the development of a female domestic service ordinance in British colonies in 1925, which banned the hiring of girls under the age of 10. This, of course, did not stop all trade, especially if the girls were older than 10. An expansion of this was included in 1933, where inspections of Muizai working conditions was routinely done. It was said that in many cases, female inspectors were not siding with the protection of the girls, and thus these inspections were not necessarily productive to protecting Muizai. So the 1933 ordinance also required the registration of Muizai to the government to prevent resale. Either way, neither of these acts stopped the Muizai system, but made it more covert and the owners started adopting them and pretending that they were family. Do see that in Hong Kong law by 1956 and across former British colonies, however, that laws protecting children from intercourse and labor develop out of the Muizai discourse. This forms the basis for much of the legal system of countries that were ruled by the British, as well as many other countries. So, in closing, let us think about why any of this matters. Reflecting on the substance of this lecture, we can summarize the significance to three points. First, that Muizai and other forms of intimate labor done by women and girls were part of the colonial everyday in Chinese immigrant communities across the Trans-Pacific. Second, that stories of Muizai highlight the discursive nature of colonial power of men, that men have used resources available to them to marginalize and restrict the economic and physical mobility of women in colonial Canada. These resources included Chinese language newspapers overseas, which represented Muizai in a way that legitimized the constraints placed on their mobility. Finally, that child trafficking became a source of contention and a key motivator for the abolishment of the Muizai system. It also helped revise legal codes regarding sex work, sex trafficking, as well as child labor in Hong Kong, Singapore, and other colonial frontiers. Some further questions that might be of interest include, how is immigration and labor gendered in the past and in the present day? 
How are categories of childhood and adulthood divided along lines of labor or gender? How are boyhood and girlhood depicted differently? How is age a category of analysis? With these questions, we come to the conclusion of this lecture. I hope that this video has proven to be an interesting introduction to Muay Thai and one rather sideline facet of transpacific gendered migration. I also hope that the work done here might encourage you to interact and use the Chinese Times archive available online as a tool for conducting research.